actually things that I could have, you know, connections and things I could have drawn out, but uh, I'm just going to do that in passing today. So in terms of the talk, uh, I must admit I'm sticking mostly to the uh, paper that I published and just trying to elaborate on, on little bits of that. Uh, I'm going to elaborate firstly by talking a bit about my own kind of research concerns and interests, uh, and then kind of fitting that in with the subject matter of the article. So that will involve talking somewhat about Luke's analysis of the concept of interests, and then looking at uh, one of the criticisms I uh, put to it, and looking at a sort of supplement which I try to develop in relation to it. So in terms of my research concerns, they're really centrally to do with epistemology, uh, questions of the status of social scientific knowledge. Uh, and that includes the three areas that I've mentioned on the slide here. Should social scientists be oriented towards truth, objectivity, validity, or something else? Can we distinguish between stronger and weaker claims about the social world? And thirdly, how do social scientific accounts relate to accounts from the actors? Is justified criticism of those accounts possible? And maybe is there two-way kind of critique possible as well that's kind of justified? And I guess to try and characterize my overall take on these issues, what I'm trying to do is look for a way beyond uh, both subjectivist positions and objectivist positions. Uh, now, I realize that's quite a familiar kind of task that people have been setting themselves at, at least since Bernstein and things uh, back in the 70s, maybe earlier than that too. Uh, so I'm just kind of in that tradition of trying to find a way to uh, avoid these problematic extremes without coming to a kind of hodgepodge in the middle as well. Um, the way I'm trying to deal with it is by arguing that when we look at these questions, for example, about disputes between different positions, uh, what we need to do is think that Validity is important, and we can think about how to assess different positions and how to compare them and work out which account is better and which account is not so good. But I want to argue that that can be done without recourse to an idea of objectivity, to the idea that there's kind of objective standards outside of subjects that we should make reference to. So we're trying to kind of balance those two things. In terms of the pieces I've written that deal with this sort of stuff, um, there's basically three of them. Uh, one I wrote a long time ago. Um, is uh, Rethinking Social Criticism, that top paper there. And that paper looks at interpretive social science, particularly the work of Peter Winch, and tries to look at how to get a kind of useful critical perspective that's consonant or uh, somewhat in agreement with that, but also has uh, perhaps some points of difference. But more recently, I've been looking at questions of interest, uh, analyzing these in relation to both uh, Margaret Archer's work and then Stephen Luke's work as well. In fact, this initial this Luke's piece started off as a kind of combined Luke's and Archer thing, but it just got too sort of unwieldy. And of course, sociology has a, um, a, a quite a tight restriction on the length of the articles, which I'm sure is very good and useful. Uh, but if you've ever submitted to sociology, you'll know it's quite punishing to try and get your sort of pieces down to that length. So that meant there was no hope of trying to cover both Luke's and Archer in that. So instead, I kind of divided them into two different pieces, and it's really the Luke's piece I'm going to talk about today with some passing reference to Archer. So why is it then that I'm interested in the concept of interests? Well, it's not really because I'm an intrinsic love of the concept, it's not that I think it's necessarily a great concept that we must hang on to in social science, but it does have important and interesting connections, I think, with sort of epistemological issues that I'm concerned with. But when we talk about interest, it's useful to be trying to be a bit more precise as well. So what I'm, uh, what's worth distinguishing is the difference between an explanatory concept of interest and an evaluative concept. In terms of the explanatory concept, that's basically uh, used by social scientists to try and explain uh, the behavior of actors or the beliefs of actors and, and explain that in a causal way. So the strong program in the sociology of scientific knowledge has this kind of approach. They might say, well, let's look at different scientists and why they believe different things. And their explanation, or part of the explanation of why they believe different things, is that they have different interests. That's what kind of leads them, almost causes them to take up different positions in the debates. The other way of talking about interests, or another kind of orientation to interests, is a more evaluative one. And this uses the notion of interest to try and assess, to try and evaluate what it is that actors are doing. So proponents of this approach, social scientists, will say, what is it in the interest of a group to do? 
uh, what would be a beneficial course of action for these uh, actors to take up? And the answer is treated evaluatively because then the uh, answer to that question can be used to uh, try and correct the beliefs and activities of people out there in society who are not sociologists. And the idea would be that if actors aren't pursuing their interests, then we can perhaps investigate why that is and also try and convince them to change the way they act, to try and find alternative ways of uh, taking things forward. And the main thread of my argument is about evaluative approaches. And there are various different visions of this around. Some visions of Marxism, I think, have this evaluative vision and just a very simplified account of that. Uh, then Marxists might argue that by continuing to participate in capitalism, by not rising up against capitalism, uh, the working class is not pursuing its own interests. Uh, Marxists contend that it is in the interest of the working class to transform capitalism. That's what they should be doing. And that's based on the judgment around their interest within that particular social structure. A second evaluative approach to interests uh, is that of Margaret Archer's critical realist work. And I've written sort of on the slide there um, because I think it's a somewhat evaluative approach, but let me try and explain why I say that. It's really because I think Archer's a bit equivocal about whether her approach is evaluative or not. So on the one hand, Archer's pretty clear that structural interests do exist. Uh, she says that courses of action are either objectively advantageous or objectively disadvantageous to actors. So there is this sort of apparent evaluation in her approach. She's making a claim about what's beneficial to actors or what's costly to them. On the other hand, she isn't actually setting up a criticism of the views of the actors that don't go along with those structural interests. So she tends to treat actors as having their own independent evaluation of matters, which she isn't intending to correct. So there's something of an evaluation in Archer's approach, is what I'm trying to say, but she doesn't really push her misimplications, and that's why it's sort of in-between kind of approach, in a sense. And third on the list there is Stephen Luke's uh, and his analysis of interest in power, a radical view. And Luke's approach is evaluative insofar as he's exploring whether or not actors are pursuing what he describes as their real interests. Uh, he argues that sometimes groups of actors may not be doing so, particularly subordinated groups of actors may not. And if such groups aren't pursuing their interests, the question is, why not? And that's where Luke gets into his analysis of power and the various dimensions of which power may come operate on actors. Now, when social scientists take this sort of overall evaluative approach on interests, I think it raises uh, interesting questions about the extent to which they're disputing with lay actors, which is always a possibility. And then that leads to the epistemological issue of how can social scientific critiques of lay actors and counter interests be justified? And I decided to write about Luke's on these matters because I'm partly sympathetic or partly sympathetic to the way he treats this question, but I thought there were also kind of limitations that were worth identifying. So I'm going to talk through my discussion of Luke's now. Now I wanted to mention one quick thing about interpreting Luke's key book, Power, A Radical View, where he discusses interest. Uh, if you've taken a look at this debate, you'll know that the first edition is very short. It's a kind of uh, short classic, 64 pages, including all the kind of front matter and sort of blank pages at the back and so on. And the second edition, is, which came out uh, in 2005, isn't much longer. It's 192 pages, and it's quite unusual for a research monograph to swell in size in this way. You can, when you look at the second edition, you can see that Luke's was very dissatisfied with some aspects of his argument in the first part of the book wants to kind of elaborate them, revise them, and so on. And he does this in an interesting way. He sort of enfolds the first edition within the second. Right? Is my attempt at animation. Oh, it's going to work. Yes, <laughs> it sort of goes around it. He kind of puts a chapter before it and then a couple of chapters after it. But he keeps the sort of initial text in there as well. Um, when I was writing the article, I did talk a little bit about the first edition approach, but mostly I stuck to the second edition, because clearly you know, he's trying to answer criticisms and develop it further there. And in this talk today, I'm just going to stick with the sort of second edition version of his arguments. So, how does Luke's approach interests? Well, I think they are actually a key part of his analysis of power, which is clearly the main topic of his book. And we can see this when we look at his account of how one party, A, exercises power over another party, B. 
He says, A exercises power over B when A affects B in a manner contrary to B's interests. And in the second edition, Luke says we should talk about this as power as domination to distinguish it from other kinds of power. Now the key question from my perspective here is how we decide what party B's interests are. And the important move that Luke makes is to argue that as a social scientist, you don't need to accept that group, group B's, understanding of what their interests are. We can say that domination is occurring, in fact, if a group's real interests are overridden. And that's the case for Luke's whether or not group B will understand that to be the case. So let's look at this a little further. The way that uh, Luke spells this out is to make a distinction between the wants and preferences of actors at any particular time, their own understanding, and then, on the other hand, their real interests. Now, these two things may coincide for Luke's, but they don't have to. And he's particularly interested in cases where he thinks actors do have misguided sense of their wants and preferences. Their preferences don't match up with their real interests. Just to give an example of this, we might think, say, uh, sorry, no, it's probably useful just to say before that, that Luke's is interested in particularly in misguided wants that perhaps the result of an imposition of an ideology or a cultural framework where a group gets misled systematically about what it is in their interest to do, about what it is desirable for them to even want. So, for example, some wealthy women in the 18th century may well have wanted and found pleasure in being seen as emotional and as strong in sentiment rather than as strong in reason. But Luke's, I think, would echo Mary Wollstonecraft in saying that those women were not actually acting in their real interest in embracing that notion of women as kind of emotional and strong in that area. They were buying into a cultural framework that was disadvantageous to them, helping to exclude them from education, political decision making, and so on. And that would be for Luke's an example of this third dimension of power. It involves one group dominating another by imposing a negative cultural framework on them. And the members of that group may not even realize that this has happened. So these kind of arguments lead me to the epistemological question I'm interested in. Uh, Lewis is clearly arguing it's possible, indeed desirable, for social scientists to have this different view. But the question is, how can they justify distinguishing their understandings from those of lay actors out there in society? So let's take a look at the way in which he does this. Again, this is something that was much more developed in the second edition of the book, partly because he'd been critiqued for not really getting fully into the issues in the first edition. And the way he expands things out is by saying we can distinguish objective and subjective concepts of interest. Subjective concepts basically say, well, if an actor wants that, it's, it's in their interest to do it, there's nothing else to say. Objective on concepts, by contrast, say that we should go beyond these preferences. Uh, members of society may be actively promoting fans of their interests. And one of the ways that um, Luke's then, one of the examples he uses to say, here's an objective approach, is uh, Charles Taylor's theory of well-being. In the article I talked a little bit about why I think that's not actually an example of an objective approach as far as Luke's understands it, but I won't talk about that here. Rather, I will say that I think the welfare-based analyses that Luke's mentions are a better example of an objective approach to the terms he's thinking of it. And he's thinking here of writers like Sen and Nussbaum who've developed these ideas. The general way this analysis goes is that we can specify the conditions which are necessary to endow people with basic human capacities. So we can come as analysts and specify that. These might be things like a reasonable standard of health, adequate nourishment, shelter, personal security, and so on. And what Luke argues is that welfare-based analyses specify conditions that are beneficial for individuals, even if those individuals don't believe they're beneficial. So somebody might deny that they want shelter, but the welfare-based analyst would say, no, that's beneficial for you, even if you don't want it. And if you follow debates around these approaches, you'll know that there are some more kind of controversial areas here. Uh, for example, Martha Nussbaum tends to argue that things like literacy are part of the kind of key elements of human capacity building and should be offered to all kind of all human beings. Whereas others have said, well, maybe that's a culturally specific framework, 
and it's wrong to assume that literacy is an essential part of human beings. So you do get into some kind of contestations there about what is objectively good or not good for uh, actors. And that does fit in with kind of Luke's over my attempt, at least, to try and get beyond actors' preferences or to claim that there is a beyond that we should be attaching ourselves to. Luke's doesn't cite Archer, but he certainly might have done because she does want to locate the source of interests outside of agent subjectivity. In her case, she wants to locate interest within a sort of structural distribution of wealth. Now, a sort of interesting thing about Luke's is that having introduced some objective accounts of interest, he doesn't actually back one in particular. He doesn't say, oh, here's some options and here's the right way to think about objectivity. He doesn't say, Sen's approach to welfare is the one that really gives us the key real interest of actors. Rather, he ends up being sort of quite cautious about the status of real and objective interests. He concedes towards the end of the book that when it comes to interests, what is real depends to a certain extent on the accounts being offered. So Luke says, well, if you're a welfare theorist, what you're going to see as real is uh, those elements that are going to promote capabilities. If you're a materialist, there will be material interest that you're interested in, in terms of ascribing what's real here. And that move seems to commit Luke to a certain pluralism about interests. And another pluralistic element to his approach is uh, in the second edition of his text. He says that real interests need not be unitary. They might be conflicting. They might clash with one another in some sense. Now, I criticize the way that he develops that argument in the article. Again, I'm not going to talk about that now. I want to elaborate rather a different line of criticism that I went down. And this criticism uh, relates to guidance as how to resolve competing accounts of interests. Now, given that Luke has acknowledged the possibility of competition, he doesn't really discuss how we actually resolve the competing the competition between understandings. He doesn't say much how to compare social scientific accounts. He doesn't say much about how to compare social scientific and lay accounts. And from my perspective, that's particularly unhelpful because he tends to link the idea of objective interest to the social scientific account as well, which I think is a potential to kind of give a sense of prioritization to what social scientists are doing, regardless of whether we can give a uh, coherent defense of why actors should believe us rather than going on their own judgments. So just to be clear, I am positive about Luke's idea that we can criticize actors and that it's a meaningful uh, thing to do. It could be part of our contribution as social scientists to do that. But there is an issue about thinking through how these kind of debates and disagreements will actually play out. And in order to address this absence in Luke's work, I draw on John Homewood's work to mention to develop a kind of pragmatist-ish sort of approach where it's not heavily committed to any particular pragmatist thinkers. I'm going to mention three aspects of this here. Uh, probably going to sound a little bit abstract, but then I have got an example that I hope will help to kind of pin it down a little bit more. So, first aspect of my approach is to say that neither lay accounts or social scientific accounts are valid on their own terms. So I reject a kind of interpretive fundamentalism that might say that um, we make the world in, our, uh, in, in whatever image we like, and then that's how the world is for us. I'm rejecting that view and saying, that when we try and make worlds with meaning, they're kind of potentially frayed and problematic in various kinds of ways. And the second point relates to the first. This is the idea that social scientists should try to work on what is problematic within the framework of those who they're studying and talking about. So here, the point is not to just to try and identify external problems, but look for puzzles and difficulties that arise for lay actors themselves when they're thinking about their own interests. And then the third phase involves an attempt by social scientists to show that their own accounts can resolve the problems in actors. So you're not just kind of saying, oh, here's this problem, there you go, and kind of running away and leaving the situation, but trying to think of a way that you might help to resolve that problem as well. So, my example. This is an example I mentioned in the paper. I'm just going to say slightly more about it here than I did in the paper itself. Uh, some lay actors, I would contend, believe that if only they could consume more, they would be happier. 
they believe that their interests lie in increasing their activities as consumers. That would be beneficial for them. In that sense, they take this stock photo as a kind of ideal. Because families always look as happy when the big shopping to give <laughs> So, how would I critically address this belief that heightening consumption is in the interest of actors? Well, firstly, I would deny that this belief about consumption is valid in its own terms. I'd suggest that believing consumption will make you happy is not the same as consumption necessarily having that effect. You can't just socially construct your way happy in this respect, as far as I'm concerned. And then secondly, I'm arguing that we need to look for ways in which the belief that greater consumption is an actor's interest, that belief, can be shown to be problematic, but to the actors in question. Now I think, when we think about this sort of issue as sociologists, we can find there's all sorts of Hegelian and Marxist resources we can draw on when we're doing so, which uh, would see the relation to objects that consumerism embodies as problematic because that the engagement with the object as a consumer is relatively superficial. But what I'm trying to say is that it's not simply enough to have an alternative theory about humans and what is uh, good for us and what's problematic for us. Um, we might have a plausible sounding theory that it is in human nature to find satisfaction through a deeper relation to objects, through creative production, rather than simply piling up the things that we bought. But we shouldn't, as social scientists, insist that we, because we have that theory, we're in touch with human nature, uh, and that we have an objective account of the interests of people. Rather, if we're going to get a legitimate critical purchase, we need to identify what's problematic from within the perspective of actors themselves. And we might use these resources, Marxist, Hegelian resources, to think, envision what the problems with consumption will be, but these need to be recognizable to actors as well. So if you were a social scientist researching with committed consumers, you might try to probe whether they do see themselves the downside to consumption. You might try to find out if they experience a kind of emotional trough, a kind of low after the high of purchasing banks worth of consumer items. And you might also discuss with them whether they recognize that kind of feeling of restless desire setting in again soon after spending. Now, if actors who had believed that consumerism was in their interests uh, would recognize those problems, well, or do when you talk to them, well, that's well and good. They're taking a critical perspective on their interests. They're starting to move to a different view, one that's perhaps breaking with the kind of view that would have been inculcated through aggressive advertising and marketing that we find within contemporary capitalism. But if they don't recognize the description that you give, it would be seriously problematic, I want to argue, as an analyst, to say that you're right anyway, that that's just their subjective perspective, that you have their objective interests right. I think it's wrong to say that their subjectivity is out of line with the objective reality of interests. Putting it another way, if you really believe that objective reality clashes with actors' subjective views, you need to be able to show how that reality you've been fastening on impacts on their views, impacts on what they're experiencing, on their happiness, their potentials, and so on. If actors really do seem happy and satisfied as consumers, you need to find a way to rethink your criticism, perhaps changing your uh, line of belief altogether. So moving on to the third stage, if the actors thank you, accept the validity of the critique, we can still uh, try and go beyond criticism to find a better account of what it's in the interest of actors to do. Now, just saying consumerism is no good, it's clearly limited, we need to perhaps develop an alternative. Again, we could use Hegelian, Marxist ideas to argue that Whereas consumers have a superficial relation with consumed objects, a deeper and more satisfying relation can be developed by pursuing activities which show skill and creativity uh, and develop those more fully. Producing an artwork, mending a motorcycle, doing some knitting, <coughs> could be argued to be the kind of skilled, productive activities that avoid this kind of emotional trough after consumption. And that would start to be an alternative account of what it's in the interest of actors to do to develop their skill and creativity. But this needs to be put to the test in order, again, to see whether actors recognize that solution. You might try and chime in with their existing experiences and say, well, you know, when, talk to me about some of the things you do and see if there are kind of resonances when you point out the uh, positive features of creative and skillful sorts of activities. And if there isn't a resonance, then again, you need to consider and reconsider 
your position, your own understanding. So let me just make a few further points about the approach I've taken. It may seem like a lot of fuss for a little of any gain, but what I'm really trying to do is develop an account of how social scientists might make a meaningful, critical contribution to interest and to understandings of interest without imposing accounts, accounts on actors. And that's why focusing on imminent problems with actors, understandings, and thinking about how to resolve those problems is important. And the second point that I haven't really sort of fully extracted is that we need to conduct criticism in a dialogic way. That means accepting that social scientific accounts can have problems within them as well. We need to be open to critiques from other social scientists and from lay actors. They may reject our suggestions and have good reasons for doing so. And it's really for that reason I dislike the way that Lewis refers to accounts of interests that go beyond those of actors as objective. Now, I agree with criticisms of this term, including feminist writers, who suggest it gives a spurious sense of kind of superiority to scientific and social scientific accounts. I think we should just refer to social scientific accounts rather than referring to objective accounts and be mindful of the kind of vulnerability of critique of others. And for this reason, that's why, even though I think there's uh, lots of great stuff in Borowoy's 2012 sociology paper, I was struck when I read it again by this quote where he says, that the one conditions, if any, does domination reveal itself of what it is, and the objective truth of the sociologist converge with the subjective experience of the worker. And really there, he does seem to be mostly focusing on the subjective experience of the worker coming to match what the sociologist thinks, rather than seeing that as a dialogue. Although, I think there is much more to that article. Uh, so, that's the kind of, it might be a question about how he's phrased that, but I think there's a lot to think through about how he relates the objective and the subjective. Finally, I want to acknowledge within my piece and in this talk, I'm pretty vague about the appropriate venues for these kinds of dialogues. I mean, I do think they can happen in research situations, as I've uh, suggested. Maybe there's other forms, social media, and getting your ideas out there in the media and then seeing people's responses, other ways to um, take forward those dialogues, which I think are really important. So, just to conclude, I uh, want to say that Luke is really important in the way he thinks about interests. He doesn't really address the capacity of accounts, so I want to take an alternative sort of pragmatist take on that. Um, and I think, I think that probably is all I want to say for me. So, thank you. <laughs>